actually got into the industry like what's your you know what's your background and, and how okay. you how you got into it yeah yeah is that a question yeah man you go for oh. it <laughs> how did i get into the industry yeah. um uh, essentially i don't have a background in in construction in fact i don't have any background in asbestos removal um, my background is medical um in the late 80s 90s early 2000s I was a medical specialist in the operating room and sold a lot of uh, diagnostic and procedural equipment into the operating room. Um, then I ended up uh, investing some money into a biotechnology company that was and has now become um, liposomal delivery, which is an interesting aspect because here in New Zealand we see lipophilic vitamin C. Mm -hmm. That was a patent that I owned until 2008. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, that same patent um, also covered off um, a product called Diclofenac, yep. which is an anti-inflammatory product, which is now known as Volterran. Mm. So we held the uh, patents for that until 2008 and received residuals from a couple companies. And um, at the same time that I was doing this, I was also involved with a bunch of other small startup companies and what have you. And uh, finally in 2015, one of my investors asked me to come down to New Zealand and check out their investment. Well, the investment was in waterproofing. It was into uh, facilities management. And they were considering purchasing a asbestos remediation company. Mm. And so I came down. I think I came uh, a couple short visits just to check out the business. And at that time in my life, it was a really nice opportunity to go experience something different. Mm. So come September, eight years ago this month, picked up, moved down here liked it mm -hmm. um, there's lots of opportunity um, the businesses were you know pretty much in their infancy and um, I ended up uh, signing on on with them and uh, I've been here ever since yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to find out about how people you know where they come from and, and how they get into what they're doing now it's, it tends to be one of the, you know, the sort of the, the cornerstones of, of what we do yeah just with with having a chat and getting to know someone and so what, what sort of intrigued you about the, the, the asbestos industry? I kind of, at the time, it was an add-on for our business because we were really working with, um, done some business with Kiwi Rail. We had uh, reinstated some work at Manukau uh, District uh, um, Hospital. Um, we'd done some interesting things, but asbestos um, had a couple contracts associated with it. One was a DOC job over on, um, um, on Rangitoto. Um, there was another job down in uh, Christchurch that we ended up doing, which was the BNZ building. Um, so there was some already uh, established contracts when we purchased the company in asbestos. Mm. And uh, at the time, it was I just figured it was going to be just another business. Mm. Mm. Little did I know that there was so much regulatory work that was starting to happen in 2016 and 2017 that it just really threw us right into the deep end for asbestos and asbestos work it was just one of those big things so if you had to learn like asbestos 101 like what it is why it's sort of a carcinogen why, why, why it's bad why we've got to remove it have you sort of had to go through that whole journey about learning about it yeah i have to do, had to jump into that and um essentially and this i, I don't know whether to thank peter ward from ward demolition or <laughs> oh, not yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but uh i went to one of the uh first meetings for the for me for new zealand demolition and asbestos association and uh, sat around a, a big table with a bunch of big shooters that have been around for a, a number of years in the industry. And he just looked at me and goes, we need fresh blood. And somebody like you should sit on the, uh, on the committee for asbestos removal. And I put my hand up and I said, okay, I'm in. If I'm in, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember somebody coming up to me afterwards and going, you don't know anything about asbestos. <laughs> and I said, you know what? It may be true, but give me six months and I'm going to know more about it than you nice right, so i think one thing about kiwis like we we do love a, an accent from another country and we think shit the different accent they sound like they know what they're talking about <laughs> not to say that you don't but it's like we do love an accent i think people from bigger countries really really um really impress us in that um and so was there anything like in particular that, that shocked you about the the whole asbestos thing is, is it the same back in in canada is the same uh, sort a little of different in canada and i didn't know this till after the fact i mean when i looked at construction or i looked at uh, building what have you i knew that there was always processes and protocols in place uh, building consents had to be uh, obtained and what have you but when we got into the asbestos business it was regulated through a class of of, of removal type class a being the very friable 
asbestos um, that needed to be handled a different way. A lot more security measures in as far as, you know, the air exchanges, the amount of uh, decontamination process. So there was the Class A work and there was the Class B work. That was pretty straightforward. Mm. But it was all the regulations around it that needed to be put into place. And in 2016-17, um, they were still working on the code of practice. Um, how are we going to do this stuff? There, there, there had been you know rules set down, and there were guidance notes and things like that previously. But they were moving towards a regulated, licensed process for removalists, so that they can actually follow within you know certain guidelines and say, hey, you know what, this is being done the correct way, mm. and everybody should be held to that standard. Mm. So. Do you do you know why? Asbestos was used, you know, as a as a material back when it was used. Like, have you gone that far back to really learn the history of it? I, I think everybody is, <clears throat> if, if around this business may have Googled it, but I mean, they literally were using it in Egyptian times. Mm. That, um, some of the big fiber uh, chrysotile stuff was used almost in the way that they could knit it together mm. and they were used as napkins um <laughs> yeah exactly you know throw it onto the fire and clean itself because it <laughs> doesn't burn right take it out wipe it off and use it again but they used asbestos uh for you know hundreds of years mm. um it wasn't really until say the 40s and 50s and 60s that they started using it in everything and right now they say there's over 1700 building products that you might find asbestos in. Mm. That's a, that's a lot of that's yeah. a lot of use. Yeah, <clears throat> that is a lot. What, what, what is it actually made of? Do you, do you, do you know that? that um, well, yeah, I, can, I, I know that there are several different types of asbestos. Yeah. Um, the three most common are um, chrysotile, which we see a lot of in cement cladding. We see it in suffetes. Mm. Um, chrysotile is kind of the more common one. It's the bigger fiber mm. product. And then there's amosite. And then you say, see, chrysotile. Those are the really small fibers. Um, you see them on things like textured ceilings. Mm -hmm. You see them on limpet that's wrapped around pipe. Yep. Um, you'll see it on meter boards, actually. You know those brown meter boards mm. that we see in houses? Yep. Pretty much every house before 1990 has one of those old meter boards. Well, those are 80% asbestos by weight and volume. Mm. So when you're removing them, it's really important that you handle them the right way. Lots going on there. Lots going on, yeah, that's right. Um, and so when you're doing the removal, like what is the, take us through that process and like what are the key sort of aspects to making sure that it's that it's done safely? Well, I think uh, true to just about any, uh, any business or any process is that you wanna understand what are you dealing with. So uh, by law, um, all commercial buildings must have an asbestos management survey. NZDAA, or the Demolition and Asbestos Association, has been really big on trying to get the quality and the competency of the management plans for these big buildings to identify where the asbestos is. So, good practice, start with a plan. Mm. Know where the asbestos is, have it identified by a professional that knows what they're looking at, and then you've got yourself the roadmap. Mm. By law, if you're gonna be doing any demolition, and I think during our heyday in the last couple, three years, 7,000 houses were coming down around mm. there. You know, there's a lot of houses, a lot, yeah. right? So you have to have a demolition survey that's specific to that building. And that's a very intrusive um, survey. Mm. That's where you actually drill into a wall. You look behind the chimney. You, you crawl under uh, the spaces that you need to. You swab the uh, ceiling space. So that gives you a very good survey mm. for that demolition purpose. Mm. When it's a commercial building, what you need is you need an overall approach. Right? Mm. So management survey, refurbishment survey, if you're gonna be taking off a lot of cladding and putting on an addition, demolition survey. Mm. So those that's your start. Mm. Let's mm. start with the start, and that's where are we, what do we got, what are we gonna do with it? Yep. From there, it gets handed over to the remove list. And in New Zealand, New Zealand has Somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 B-class licenses, and they have over 110, I think it's coming in on 130, A-class licenses. Mm. So a B-class license allows you to take B-class material, cladding, suffetes, uh, decromastic roofs, Super 6 products. Mm. A-class allows you to go into the tough areas, mm. textured ceilings that need to be 
fully decontaminated and fully set up with negative pressure units, um, limpet around pipes, gaskets, stuff like that. Mm. Um, so you've got to then take that survey and hire the appropriate licensed company to take that asbestos away. Mm. Then the third stage is licensed assessment. In other words, did that removal company do it the right way? So what WorkSafe did here is they said, we're going to license people that are accredited, that know what the process is for removal, can analyze the survey in such a way that the work that gets done is done correctly mm -hmm. and within the regulations and the code of practice. They will then sign off on it and say, great job. You did a fantastic <laughs> job. You didn't contaminate the rest of the house. Mm. Everything that was removed was removed correctly, and here's your clearance certificate. So those that's your three steps within within uh, the asbestos removal process. It, it sounds like <clears throat> it sounds like a very robust process, uh, but I'd imagine there's there's still probably been some cowboys out there, you know, with, with you know people that don't sort of follow the process. Hopefully, hopefully not. But I'd imagine there has been. Yeah, there, that that <coughs> obviously happens. It happens in all industries. I mean, mm. we saw it with the leaky, mm. leaky home syndrome, and we saw um, we and we see it all the time. You mm. know, a new roof goes on, the flashing is terrible. Uh, you've got a leak somewhere that something doesn't fit the mm. way it is, and you see people cutting corners. And the unfortunate part here in New Zealand is that the barrier to entry to get a general B class license is not that difficult. Mm. Um, in fact, um, some statistics point out that in the United Kingdom, um, comparative to New Zealand, New Zealand has eight times more asbestos removal companies per capita than the United Kingdom. Wow. It doesn't cost a lot to get involved yeah. with the B-class removal. And this is the crazy part. You're only paying on average of around $150 per year for a license that you get for five years. Well, I mean, that's, that same, yeah, that barrier to entry, like you say, is pretty, pretty low, isn't it? Yeah, and that, yeah. that attracts, um, unfortunately, uh, unskilled mm. uh, removalists and the cowboys that you talk about. So mm. you got to make sure that you've got, you know, a good, reputable company that's got the right licenses and goes through the full process. Mm. And that's what NZDA is really pushing for is quality, competency, and just making sure we're following the regulations straight straight through, yep. front to back. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it is. I, I would love to see the uh, prices increase. In the United Kingdom, I think an, a license is somewhere around 3,000 pounds per year mm -hmm. for that company. Mm. I'd love to see our, uh, our cost to uh, have a license increase. You'd soon see a lot of the cowboy operators fall away I'd imagine you said before about the commercial buildings needing uh, like an, ass an assessment or a management plan do they do they have to get a plan even if there's no um, asbestos is that just a regulation of the commercial buildings um, well what uh, what the New Zealand has done is they said every building that was built before the year 2000 mm. needs to have an asbestos management system right, right? Yeah. they've got to have a survey in place um, and that's because they literally kind of stopped uh, making it and importing it here in about 1990. Mm. Uh, Hardy was uh, making a lot of cement cladding down in Penrose area right up until 1990. Mm. And there was leftovers that obviously sat in the warehouses and people used it for building after that. So the 2000 and before that, every single commercial building should have a asbestos management system. Mm. And it's for the safety of the tradies that go in there. It's that plumber that goes in to drill something. It's the electrician that's crawling around in that roof space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that concrete guy that needed to get access something and he didn't recognize. Mm -hmm. So, you know, WorkSafe is there to create a safe workplace. Mm -hmm. Commercial uh, buildings need to have that roadmap. It needs to be mapped out. And this goes on for, you know, like I have this conversation a lot with um, property managers. They say, oh, no, it's just a residential area. Mm. Well, yeah, it might be a residential house, but you, do, whoever the owner is, and he may have 10 of these houses. He may have three. He may have 70 of them. I don't know. That's a commercial business, mm. yeah. and that falls within it. And those homes need to have a survey. So I'll be reading between the lines. It sounds like a lot of 
like residential homes may not have a, a residential survey, but they should. Would that fall under the part of that healthy homes thing, do you think? Um, I think it falls closer to the healthy homes. I mm. mean, not every home needs to have. Mm. If it's your house, that's your kingdom. That's your mm. castle. But if it's being operated like a rental property, a commercial venture, then yep. it probably should have. The definition is it's a commercial entity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll debate anybody on it, but mm. I, I know it's a business, and that's where it's going. So it's a commercial entity. Mm. Yeah. All right. So we, we've got a we've got a building. Um, we've had the plan um, done. We, at what point do you do does the owner say right? We've got to get this stuff removed. We've got to you know remediate the building and that sort of thing. And then they get in touch with you guys. Um, actually, um, a lot of buildings have asbestos in them mm. that are built before you know about two thousand. Um, but the surveyor will actually put a risk score on it, mm-hmm. and that risk score is what is the um, what's the condition of the asbestos? How often is it being frequented? Right. And um, what happens, uh, you know, if it deteriorates any further? Mm. So there's there's a risk factor on it. Anything that's uh, above a certain number, I can't remember, I think it's numbers, I think it's seven. Mm. They really need to view something as an action plan within that year. Mm. Um, if it's inert, it's a painted suffete or it's weatherboard that's in good condition. Nobody's driven a car into it or something like that. Then for the most part, it can stay exactly the way that it is. Mm. Um, but those need to be reviewed on an annual basis as well. You yeah. need to look at that building and go, okay, where are we at? You know, this is the story. Then at that point, if you need it remediated, you would contact the appropriate removalist. Yep. I want to, want to talk about the, um, the actual, the, the, the hands that are actually removing the, you know, the stuff that the technicians that go in and actually physically remove the asbestos. What yep. sort of what sort of precautions do they have to take to, to keep safe, like while, while they're working? And that's a good question, actually. Um, so, um, each of the asbestos removalists must have a health check. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's got to be done. I believe it's every year. It includes um, a spirometry test, check their lung function. Um, each of our workers also must have face fit. Right, so if they're working in um, in the asbestos environment, uh, they should have a face fit to see that the mask that they're wearing is an appropriate mask. Mm. If it's a class A job, right, they they have to wear a full face mask, right, and that full face mask a lot of times is battery powered and what have you, so mm. it's got some little bit of positive air in it as well. So those are those are some of the immediate things that you need. You got to make sure that um, you're wearing overalls. Mm best to be wearing gloves in a class environments where it's very friable and what have you you're working inside an area and you don't want to drag anything outside wear booties Mm -hmm. right your mask fits well and it's got to fit um above outside of your uh overalls lighting there's a lot of things that Mm -hmm. go on uh involved with it um with a class a um removal something like a textured ceiling Textured ceilings have to be a double wrapped in po- in poly, so there's got to be a minimum of 200 microns of poly in there, uh, double wrapped. Um, you need a full three stage minimum decontamination setup with a shower unit in it. Yes. Yeah. Um, you have a negative pressure unit that actually is vented out, uh, vents out the air. So what it does is it pulls all of the air that's in there through that unit. Mm. And that unit has a 14 um, HEPA filter on it, and that uh, 14 HEPA filter filters out all of the the the, uh, the fibers. Mm. And then we blow the air out the back end. Meanwhile, while we're doing all mm. this, that licensed assessor that I was telling you about, mm-hmm. he's actually setting up air modules at the end of where that air is coming out to make sure there are no fibers coming out of there wow. that exceed the acceptable level. And he's going to do it at the other end where the decontamination unit is. Mm. So there's a whole bunch of steps and processes. And a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, they start asking a lot more questions when they start figuring out, well, this is kind of an expensive process. It needs to be. Yeah, and it needs to be, right? So those are all the rules and the regulations that are set up around it. Class A is definitely a lot more technical than Class B, um, but there's still that same precautions around it, Mm. using water and stuff like that. If you're doing a say a removal that's an exterior of a building, yeah, do you have to would you have to like set up a scaffold and like wrap the building so it can't get out, or is it different 
for the Intune? Yeah, it's, it's different. It's a mm -hmm. Class B material um, in most cases on the exterior of a house. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll see the good companies uh, run an air monitor outside um, just for more analytics and mm. background on it. But no, um, you know, full uh, PPE, full RPE. Um, it's best to spray beforehand, get it, keep it wet, yeah. uh, make sure there's drop sheets in place. Um, even when you're pulling the nail heads out for, you mm -hmm. know, for the sheets, go back in and actually drill out where that nail hole was because you will find that there's fibers inside that too. Mm. So, yeah, it's not the same precautions as Class A, but, it, I mean, it's still pretty serious. I mean, we want to take those pieces of asbestos off in one sheet. Mm. Yeah. And we were talking before about, you know, the the – issues with finding labor and, and staff and that and then you mentioned the the barrier to entry as well what, what sort of training is provided for you know people that either come into the industry or people that are that are working in the in that in that sort of removal space um by law if you're going to be working in a b uh, class environment um it's best to obviously to have the training beforehand mm. um but you have um, literally five to ten days uh, working in that environment under supervision mm. to ensure that this is something that you want to do um, but there are um, three courses that you need to go through as part of your accreditation one is a b class license um anywhere from 450 to seven hundred dollars to take mm -hmm. um at this point, it's a, a kind of a shortened uh, version of, uh, of the length that we would like to see at the NZDAA. Mm. We'd actually like to see it um, up a little bit higher in the NZQA standard. Um, there's the A-class course, and then there's the supervisor's course. Uh, those people that are going to be overseeing the removal list in there as well. So we're at NZDAA, we're really kind of working towards uh, CPD or, you know, the the uh, uh, professional development model mm. uh, so that we can actually implement some more courses in there a little bit more specific to you know the removal aspects of uh, class a and and b so there is some movement in that area but the minimum is um, you know those courses that i just just mm. uh, talked about so when when someone <clears throat> becomes like a removal technician or whatever the, the job title is they would have gone through that baseline training and you know they don't just sort of rock up and with a mask and a bloody shovel and stuff, <laughs> hacking away at something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that. We we love the uh, the idea of uh, calling our guys uh, technicians because mm. in a lot of cases they're highly trained. They they have to take these courses. Mm. A lot of cases they'll take uh, EWP training. They'll take um, harness uh, uh, training for working at heights. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's there's confined spaces in some cases. So, you know, th there's a fair amount of training that goes into it mm -hmm. and uh, they must, you know, get all the uh, get all the accreditations. If you want to become a supervisor, you actually have to show on the log your 200 days of working in a B class environment mm -hmm. and um, and put that forward to WorkSafe and then they will nom they will nominate you and give you your license as a supervisor. Mm -hmm little different on the A class they're reviewing it right now but you could spend as much as two years plus in an A class environment before you could become a supervisor mm. so that's actually really regulated. yeah that's really good to hear because you know it, it's dealing with a, a bloody dangerous uh, you know substance so it's good to hear that they have to go through training they're taking all the right precautions because you know if they're working in that environment day in day out they've got a much higher chance of having an issue from asbestos than we would so yeah. it's good to know that they, they've got all those precautions around them. Yeah. We should probably segue into uh, you you know, some it. of the yeah. diseases that are yeah. associated with it as well. Cool. Um, you know, because a lot of people go, well, you know, yeah, okay, I was exposed to asbestos when I was a kid, right? I didn't, I don't have mesothelioma. Mm. You know, I don't have asbestosis. I don't have shortness of breath. There's no breath. Um, there's like, you know, how mm. dangerous can it be? Mm. <laughs> well, there's over 200 deaths per year in New Zealand oh, that's associated with asbestos, asbestosis, mesothelioma. And in a lot of cases, especially with mesothelioma, it takes uh, some years before it actually, you know, can be detected. Yeah. You can have it. It could stay in situ for, you know, a number of years. You don't know it. And then it metastasizes. And mm. the next thing you know, you're going into the doctor with shortness of breath and mm. a few other things. Um, I was just talking with... Um, somebody last week and uh he's been in the business for 30 years and i phoned him up and i said listen <laughs> phoning you for a couple reasons but i said i'm sorry to hear about you know your recent diagnosis of mesothelioma and he goes yeah i said what you had a couple ribs taken he goes three ribs 
two lobes. And I go, so what's the prognosis? He goes, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going going through irradiation right now. And he says, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I go, you know what I'd love? I'd love for you to be a spokesman for our industry. Would you be interested in saying some words if we could? He goes, oh, hell yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm all over that. I'd love to do that. And I go, great. And he said to me, he goes, I know the exact day that I got it. Oh, well. And I said, don't tell me the story. Yeah. Hold off on it. I want to hear it. And I mean, I don't know if that's the case, but I can tell you, it's a, one of those long diseases. Mm. And we don't find out, out about it until later. It's your dad. It's, you know, somebody, your uncle, right? Mm. He was cutting some suffetes with a skill saw upside down with a cigarette hanging out your his mouth, right? That's the guy. Yeah. 40% higher chance of getting asbestosis or mesothelioma if you were a smoker. Right. Right? So come on, let's put ourselves back in 1970 or yeah. 1980 and you're Everyone's messing with smoking. this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it was going on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are the two two major things. I'm doing a golf tournament uh, on Thursday for mm-hmm. the Mesothelioma Trust. Oh, wow. um, we're trying to create that awareness out there. And that's one of the reasons I've agreed to come on here mm-hmm. is that NZDAA really wants to have everybody understand there's dangers associated with asbestos and asbestos removal. And if we follow the process and protocols, we're going to have a safer environment. Absolutely. It, that, um, I won't even try and repeat the name of that, um, that uh, disease, but is that, is that a terminal disease? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. will be. Yeah. yeah. I worked with a guy in early 2000s, and he came into the office, and as white as a ghost, and I go, what's going on? And he goes, I got this thing. I got mesothelioma. I'm like, what's mesothelioma? He said, it's an asbestos disease. And he, I said, how did you get it? And he said, uh, we were scraping the ceilings of the uh, old arm, uh, Navy boats in Malta. He said, we did that for two years. And he said, that's where they say I got it. Mm. I'm like, wow. It's, sure enough, six months later, he was gone. Shit. Yeah. And that, that guy that had it and said he knew when he got it, that would have, he must have, well, there must have been a day where he just thought, oh, might put the mask on or just you know might have done something out of procedure out of system or whatever and you know. i'm looking for I'm, i want to hear the story mm. i just told him to hold off on it so we'll be talking talking with him in the next couple of weeks but guys like steve mcqueen remember that actor mm. yep. mesothelioma is that right warren zivon the, the singer you know that werewolves of london song from mm. back in the day yeah mesothelioma so you don't know when and where right and you got to be really super conscientious especially if you're working around this stuff mm. That um that testing you were talking about before, is it essential that every building has a has a test done, or can you just you just go oh that's definitely bloody asbestos we don't need to test it, or do they always have to have a test when they have the management plan? There's definitely an element of presumption in it, mm. um, but that's why it's really important to get somebody that's doing hundred of these uh, you know a, a year type mm. deal. Mm. Um, it's like a healthy home thing, mm. you know. You, these people know that's mold, yeah. right? That's an issue with circulation. You've got an electrical problem down there. Same thing with asbestos. He'll go in here and they will go in, sorry, I shouldn't say he, um, they will go in and they'll have a really good educated guess as to what is going on there. So you will you will see some presumptive aspect of it, but you will also see um, lab tests mm-hmm. that are done on it. Mm-hmm. I would expect lab tests to get done on management service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So once, once the asbestos has been removed from the building, what the hell, what do you do with it then? Like, how do you actually dispose of that stuff? You can't just throw it in the rubbish bin, I'd imagine. You must have to, must be some pretty strict protocols around disposing of it. There, there's definitely strict protocols on it. Um, <clears throat> uh, they have to be double bagged, mm. right? It's got to be wrapped in 200 micron again twice. Um, transporting it, um, you need to identify that you are transporting asbestos. There should be stickers on anything that's going out of there. Um, there's only three places where you'll find asbestos tipped here in Auckland, and we're looking towards um, a national registry of where to take asbestos. That still has not been combined, or can we even find? Mm. But um, here in uh, Auckland, you'll find it up in Redvale, uh, down at Hampton Downs, yep. and uh, Whitford takes it. Mm. And you can take asbestos uh, in soil to, I think, one or two other places beyond mm. that, and that's about it. Mm. So very limited. Very expensive to tip as well. A ton of asbestos uh, waste can go as high as $570 a ton. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. think about what goes in that truck, right? Mm -hmm. You, know, you mm -hmm. fill a couple, three tons, and then all of a sudden you're at two grand for shipping and the whole bit. So, wow. yeah, it is expensive, and it is taking up the landfill. Unfortunately, there's lots of it in, mm. in New Zealand. Mm. Yeah, that's. I think back to what you mentioned before about demolition, and you know, you see these buildings on TV over in the states or in China, wherever, and they, you know, they bring them down and they control demolition. Would would people go through those buildings? prior to that and remove the asbestos because you think there's a lot of dust yep. <laughs> is there any asbestos in that dust yeah absolutely mm -hmm. i mean that is the process is to remove that to, to a level that is reasonable and practicable mm. right um i've been involved with one particular building and it was reasonable to assume that we could get it all but when it's lodged between a cement beam holding up the building mm. and a concrete slab that's also holding up the building how do you get to yeah. that back side of it so mm. yeah there's still a, a reasonable and practicable amount that you can remove and go yeah. from there um yeah, yeah. I, I think that that world trade center thing they've talked about it yeah. as as being probably a lot of asbestos in mm. there but we haven't seen the asbestos or mesothelioma numbers come out yet 20 years later yeah 20 20 what is it 22 years 22 and that's that seems still seems like yesterday in some ways when you think back to that yeah it bloody changed the world didn't it um yeah so and so with the um trying to get rid of asbestos from buildings is is there a point where they are they just trying to get like so it's zero or do you think there's always going to be asbestos used in the in the building products and it's not reasonable to assume that you can get all the fibers out mm. it's just too difficult um, you just want to get it to a point where you believe that it's safe. Mm. Um, you know, I joke that you know, on a windy day, hot summer windy day in Penrose, mm. you might find fibers of asbestos in the air. Wow! Right? We've had uh, Christchurch check their water, mm -hmm. and they found that there's you know fibers in the water. So <clears throat> yeah, it's a widely used product. Mm. It it is everywhere. We try as a, a profession to remove everything that we absolutely can, but um, you know, there's always a risk element associated mm. with it, and that's why it's such a serious, you know, uh, mm. business. Yeah, and so when when they stopped using asbestos, like what did, what was it replaced with? Because I mean, it must have left a pretty big hole in the building, uh, sup like product supply chain. Yeah, uh, I think that's. Yeah. I, I well, literally. Um, They've changed the composition of cement sheeting. Mm. It's lighter now. When you take a look at the cement sheeting about from before, the asbestos uh, is quite noticeable, actually. You can almost see the little white hairs mm. in it. Mm. Um, now they've gone to almost like a slate comp Com, uh, compilation for for it mm. so it's almost layered it's almost layered down so that's changed it you're not going to get the insulatory factors that were given with as, asbestos mm. or the fire prevention why do you think that the uh, meter boards uh, are 80 yeah, percent fireproof yeah, yeah fireproof mm -hmm. right so you know the, it's hard to replicate some of the stuff but you know Think about what's happened in the last 25 years is with composites and uh, different materials and mm. what have you so you're seeing the gap being filled but back in the day asbestos was the miracle product mm. it really mm. was yeah and that's that's what kind of leads me to think or is, is there something that's being used now or developed now that's possibly going to be another asbestos you know in 50 years time you know like i don't know um, without naming any products or anything I, specifically I, I wouldn't know we kind of hope not right no <laughs> well you're seeing all kind of new building technologies yeah. go off right so i i have no idea i mean mm. we've looked at some interesting s stuff um um, recently, we've got associated with a cementitious product that actually has cork in it. Mm. So it makes it 40% uh, more flexible, 30% uh, more uh, insulatory factor off of it, and the weight is, you know, more than half. Mm. So you might see some products get used like that to replace it, but, you know, it's hard to replace something that was used for 40 or 50 years and was doing really well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The miracle product, eh? yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, well, I guess they Jeez. all thought it was the miracle product back then, but <laughs> probably a few people are. <laughs> like, a bit I shouldn't go on record. Scratch up from this, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Um, have you got any any sort of cases of of you know either success stories or where people have pushed back and said, "Oh no, we don't need to bloody remove this," because I'd imagine it'd be it'd be a pretty straightforward sort of thing. It's like you got asbestos, you got to remove it. Is it, is it that? Um, you know, back to that, you know, it's your house, it's your, you know, that's your, you're the king of the house, you can do as you choose. If mm. you want, if you want to keep it there, it's up to you. Mm. Like, there isn't a rule that says you must get rid of it. Um, 
But at the same time, you want to make sure that your family is safe, mm. right? If it's in good nick, if it's painted, if it's encapsulated, if it's you know inert, mm. leave it. Leave it the way that it is. If it's a commercial building, identify it mm. and understand what could possibly go on it. So, I mean, I can go, I easily go into horror stories because there are a lot of horror stories where people have gone out and tried to do it themselves or they've hired that cowboy mm. <laughs> to go in and do it. And the next thing you know, they're, they're cleaning up the whole house. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just had it recently with the floods here in, in Auckland. Everybody didn't recognize that the vinyl floor that they were pulling up because it had curled on the edges and it didn't look good and there was mud on it. It has asbestos in it. Mm. Paperback vinyl has, uh, again, that little paper, you know, really crumbly stuff. Mm. It's high percentage of asbestos by volume. So, <laughs> so you know, these guys have pulled it all up. They've managed to contaminate not only the laundry room. It's gone into the hallway. It's gone down the down the down into the kid's bedroom or it's moved into the lounge where they mm. are. And they don't recognize it. Mm. And we've seen this, you know countless times Mm. every year we're hearing about it or we're hearing about an accident where they disrupted a ceiling and the ceiling has gone on the couch and then the couch gone onto the Mm. you know the sweaters and it's like it happens and it's you know those are the horror stories that you Mm. go geez i didn't realize and i didn't understand it draws a lot of parallels with um with like meth contamination um we do a lot of work with a with a company um crime scene cleaners who as you're talking i'm sort of picturing what what they wear and how they dispose of things and you know the meth testing and, and meth decontamination is sounds very similar you know it's very yep. invasive bloody um you know chemical that gets into all the building um you know linings and all that sort of thing yeah and the molecule associated with meth is so small too mm. it's, it's hard to drive it out of the corporals of the of the of the jib so mm. Mm. you know they're in there and scrubbing away in a lot of cases you know pulling away that jib mm. it is it's 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 serious business and you don't need that mm. you know in your home environment for certain so mm. yeah they've got processes it's interesting um the mold and the meth guys are not regulated in the same way as asbestos is mm. however it is a dangerous removal process mm. right so you don't want to be in homes like that but you know there's other areas too there's silica mm. right um, one of the things that NZDA has done is they've worked on an app for um, people exposed so if you go on to the WorkSafe website and you google it you can find a um, health exposure registration mm-hmm. And in there, it states, okay, what was I exposed to? Fill out your PDF form and file it in. Well, NZDAA is now working on an app for all of the asbestos removalists in the country Mm. because they're supposed to, by law, have a log of everywhere they've worked. So this app will actually say, okay, I worked at this particular place. I was exposed to meth, perhaps, Mm. mold, perhaps, class A or class B, or... By chance, some carcinogenic uh, material fluid that was opened, and I feel dizzy. NZDA is working on that kind of stuff because silica, mold, meth, these are all serious things. Mm. So they should be held in the same regard as uh, asbestos removal, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely, and that can only be good for the industry and for people that are you know, working in the industry. They've got to be you know, able to go home at the end of the day and live a long and happy life you know so <laughs> we say that to uh to our workers and mm. say literally you want to make sure that you go home and be proud of the day that you've put in mm. and you want to make sure that you have done it safely mm. so that you can can go home and enjoy your family yeah. that's to us that's that's paramount yeah. i think it should be in every business totally agree yep. yeah totally agree um just before we wrap it up like what can you explain more about the nzdaa and what that what that does yeah nzdaa is an association of almost a hundred demolition and asbestos removal companies in the uh, in new zealand um, we're working very closely with um, worksafe the new guidelines um, we've just implemented or are about to implement guidelines for safe demolition um, if you can believe this um, you can demolish a house below three stories in this city with no paperwork well no building consent no license you don't need anything as long as the power's off and the water's off and the gas is off 
you knock it down. So we've just come out with a, um, a module of guidelines so that we can actually move through and educate all the people that are doing demolition and working in this space. Um, we've also created something for um, three stories and above. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so NZDEA is about demolition and 70% of demolition is usually associated with asbestos. Mm -hmm. So demolition and asbestos associations have worked hand in hand for a number of years. I believe it's over 20 plus years old. Mm -hmm. And um, and quite frankly, I've only been involved for the last seven, but um, there's been some great strides in getting more interaction with the key people and making sure things get done and the awareness level goes up. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I guess it's around like, yeah, like you say, awareness, um, legislation you know, education for the for all the people involved so yeah it's good to see that that industry has got a, a a body like that to you know to, to drive those standards it's, it's bloody important I, absolutely mm -hmm. and uh, you know new zealand's you know got a lot of associations out mm -hmm. there and we're just moving to make the quality of what we do in our industry better mm -hmm. so um, we've had some success and i think the last few years we've been making some big big leaps so um, mm. I'm hoping that uh, that we see a lot of, more of our companies join in with NZDAA and, mm. and move towards that common goal. The good ones will. The, the cowboys that are out there, if there are a few, they won't. You know, they'll steer clear of it because yeah. it might mean some compliance costs for them. Or, they know. You know, know who we're talking yeah. about, right? <laughs> yeah, they, they know who they are. <laughs> yeah, mate. Well, thanks. Really appreciate that. It's been a real in interesting chat today, and it's – one thing I like about doing this is I end up learning a whole lot about you know different industries too. So it's been really good to you know dig a bit more into the old asbestos removal and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think you know people get some good value out of this. So yeah, appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you so much. Actually, I, I appreciate you even bringing this up because mm. it's all about the awareness and mm. uh, whether it's an education piece or not. Mm. Uh, I just want people to be more aware of you mm. know what is out there, especially with asbestos and demolition. Cool. Good. Thanks, mate. All right, man. Cheers. Thank you.